Good morning and welcome to the latest VitaShares webinar, an introduction to exchange traded funds. My name is Sarah Hare and I will be taking you through the conversation today. Some important information to start with. So as we go through the topic, we'll be talking uh, general in nature, nothing, um, there are no recommendations, past performance is not indicative of future performance and we always recommend that you do do your research and you speak to a financial professional before making a decision. We invite you to ask questions and we will try and get to as many as possible at the end. Um, you can do that by using the widget I think on the right hand side of your screen, the question mark, if you type that in there, Adam and I will be able to see and we will get through as many as we can. A recording of the session will be sent to all attendees and um, people who have registered uh, later this afternoon. A little bit about VitaShares uh, for those who may not be familiar. Uh, we started, we founded in 2009 we have 63 funds and over uh, 19 billion in funds under management. Our objective is the same today as it was in 2009. We provide intelligent investment solutions to help Australian investors meet their objectives. A little bit about the ETF story in Australia, and it feels like a timely uh, timely moment to be bringing you this, this webinar. ETFs are definitely becoming more mainstream. The first ETF was listed on the ASX or first launched in August 2001. So we're celebrating our 20 year anniversary of ETFs in Australia. The industry uh, is just over 115 billion assets under management and there are over 220 exchange traded products available, covering a range of different asset classes, a number of different exposures, uh, so that you can see that the industry has grown from two, two funds in August 2001 uh, to, to over 200. The agenda today, uh, we'll be talking about the different types of exchange traded products, some things to keep in mind when you are ready to, to make your investment, the actual buying and selling of exchange traded products. And then, then we might just touch, in, uh, touch, touch on how different types of funds can be used in a portfolio. So how you might think about uh, when, when you're ready to, to start constructing. So I'm delighted to introduce my colleague, um, Adam O'Connor. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Sarah. Um... Yeah, welcome everyone to our webinar. I guess uh, from my end, uh, what we're aiming to do today is really leave you with a, a better understanding of what ETFs are and demystify some of the terminology you will come across around ETFs and the various types of different types of ETFs available and hopefully give you a little bit more confidence when it comes to building out your portfolio with ETFs. Yeah, so a great, great, Entry level introduction. So uh, the first the first topic on the agenda is the different types of exchange traded products. And what we've tried to do here also is um, working with Adam. We've incorporated some of the questions that you have made uh, during that registration process, and we tried to answer as many as we can during the during the um, presentation. Uh, and also, if you've got more, you can um, ask them, and we'll get to more. But Let's start it off, Adam. The very first one. What is an ETF? That's the uh, that's the 101 question. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think the easiest way to understand what an ETF is um, really just read it backwards. An ETF is a fund that's traded on the exchange, and what that means for investors in its simplest terms is that they're an investment vehicle which pulls investors' funds to invest in a basket of assets. And so in that respect, they are one and the same as a managed fund, or I often get this one, a mutual fund, if you read a lot of the, the US-based literature. What that means more importantly is just like a traditional managed fund, 
from a legal standpoint and a regulation standpoint, they're what's known as a managed investment scheme. And so they carry a number of very critical investor protections. It also means that any of the assets that the fund invests in are held by a third party custodian for the benefit of unit holders. And so they aren't assets that belong to beta shares. They're not assets that belong to the custodian. And this is a question we get a lot. Yeah. In the event that beta shares becomes insolvent or the custodian becomes insolvent, what happens to my assets? Absolutely. Generally, what would generally what would happen in that event is the fund would be wound up and it means that your, your assets aren't lost. Um, the way they differ from a managed fund is simply in how you as an investor buy and sell units in the fund. With an ETF, units are traded on an exchange under a stock code with live pricing throughout the trading day, rather than what you had to do previously with a managed fund where you had to apply and redeem directly with the fund manager or um, via, a, via a platform. Mm -hmm. And with an ETF, um, importantly as well, without getting too technical, this is generally done via what's known as a market maker, and they're a third party provider who are there during the trading day to make the market for you and provide you with liquidity when you need it. Mm -hmm. And that trading day being 10 to 4. 10 to 4. Um, so, I guess breaking that down into its simplest terms, we will often, and, and many people will often describe an ETF as just a uh, progress in technology. Um, and we've got a good slide here, which sort of gives you some, some analogies to work with. Um, I guess coming up onto, coming up onto the next slide, there's a, there's a few here. Um, my favorite one, um, which I think resonates with, pretty well is the CD to Spotify analogy. And basically what we know with music becoming digitized, we went from the record to the cassette, to the CD. Basically, you know, because music is now digitized, you no longer need to carry around hardware for music. With the digitization of the stock exchange, you no longer need to, there is no longer a trading floor. You can buy and sell shares at home. The same with a fund. You no longer need to use paperwork to apply directly with a fund manager. You can just do it on the exchange um, in a market that's made for you. And while um, exchange traded funds become more mainstream, um, there are those products that, that people are familiar with and that often refer to. So what is the difference between ETFs and managed funds, which you've, you've um, started to highlight? And then what's the difference between uh, ET, passive ETFs and active ETFs, and then a lot of people will be familiar with LICs or listed invested investment companies. How do they all you know, work together? I sort of covered basically that ETFs and managed funds are, are largely one and the same. So I'll probably start with, with active versus, versus passive. And we've got here an unlisted active fund and a, an unlisted index fund. So with an active fund, what you're doing is you're paying for a manager to essentially make decisions on where to invest the funds. And so they're typically more expensive than index funds, which are passive funds. And what a passive fund means is that rather than trying to beat the index, um, they try to replicate the market. They're basically trying to be the market. And so they try and replicate the market by holding everything in the same weight as that index. Now, I'll, there is a wealth of information available on the active versus passive debate. I'm, I'm not going to get into that. I certainly encourage people to make their own decisions around their own personal investment philosophy around active and passive. What I will say though, while we're on the topic, is the evidence is very compelling that over the long term, um, passive tends to outperform active in many of your large efficient markets, particularly large cap equities. Um, large cap equities is an example. It's extremely difficult for active management managers to generate sustained and, and consistent outperformance over a, over a passive benchmark. Um, one thing that you investors may want to look at when looking at active 
versus passive is uh, what's called the SPIVA report. Um, that's released every year by S&P Dow Jones and it shows an active versus passive scorecard. To, just to touch on some of the data, last year what it showed, 75% of large cap active managers in the US had underperformed the S&P 500 over a rolling five year period. When you go out to 20 years, that number is 94% of active managers had underperformed the benchmark over a 20 year period. And so when you're thinking about you know, certain investment portfolios you might have, you look at something like superannuation where chances are your investment time frame is a lot longer, those are things you might consider. The LIC is one we get a lot of questions about versus an ETF. Um, and an LIC is different in that it's a company, not a fund. And so when you invest in, LIC, in an LIC, you're owning shares in the LIC rather than the underlying assets as you do in a unit trust fund format. The main point with an LIC for investors is it has a set number of shares on issue as opposed to an ETF, which is open-ended. Um, and the market is made for you. When you have a set number of shares on issue, the price that you pay is determined by buyers and sellers. And so you have supply and demand mechanics, which can be good if there's a lot of buyers driving up the price of the LIC. But what we do know is the opposite is far more common. Most LICs do trade at a discount to the net asset. And the other key consideration is that with an ETF, you have a market made for you and you'll have liquidity when you need it. When there is no market maker and there's a shit number of shares on issue, in a market sell-off, for example, there may be no buyers on the screen and if you need to get out, there may be no one there offering you liquidity. Mm -hmm. I think um, that term fair value. Yes. Um, and, and people often say that, you know, one of the advantages of, of exchange traded products is, is they trade at fair value um, and they're open ended. So a lot of these uh, terms may be new to people, um, but, you know, just just even you explaining them, it starts to make sense. Closed ended, trading at a discount, open ended, yeah. fair value, things like that. Um, it, it's definitely um, interesting to compare the different types of products that, that are still available to, to um, buy and exchange, but just the differences that, that they have. So as we move along to the next set of questions, and we, we sort of looked at, looked at these, we had a lot of questions about hedged and unhedged, and, what's, and, and you'll hear me flipping back and forth between ETP and ETF. Um, and and synthetic funds. So, what's what's in the name? So, yeah. So that. ETP and ETF is probably the easiest one to cover to cover first. Uh, you could reference both. They're often used in, interchangeably, uh, but they simply come down to naming conventions, which we'll we'll talk to now. An ETP is an exchange traded product. It covers all the different types of exchange traded products that we've got listed here. An ETF is a subset of that, but it's it's the most common and widely used of the ETP. So you'll often hear an ETP and ETF sort of used interchangeably. ASIC have an information sheet which I've got here. Um, it's available online with it with a quick Google search, and I do recommend it's it's very short. Um, I would recommend having it having a quick read of it if you want to just get more more detail on and, and understand some of the different types a little bit better. Um, but I guess going through some of the different naming conventions um, in terms of those common questions that, that we just covered there. Um, currency hedging is one that we get a lot of questions on even in advance of this webinar. What currency hedging means is simply that the fund invests in a way that removes foreign currency exposure. I think what is underappreciated by a lot of investors when they maybe look at an international ETF they hold, say maybe a NASDAQ 100 or, an, or a US ETF. Um, you know, they might see that the US market's up, you know, 20% for the year and they may be only up 15%. The difference there would, you, would, would largely be currency. And they, they may not appreciate that when you buy a US asset, which we do, so we buy an Apple stock, we're taking, when we buy that in US dollars, 
we're buying both the Apple stock and the equivalent value in US dollars. When we currency hedge that, we just use an instrument which neutralizes the US dollar exposure and just means that you get exposure to the movement in the Apple stock. I think importantly um, for investors to understand, there really isn't, the, the wealth of evidence says that, you know, over the long term, there's really not a lot of difference um, in uh, hedged versus unhedged for long term portfolio performance. Okay, interesting. And uh, just, I think we've got some examples yeah. of, of the different funds. Yeah, and I've got some got some here, which across our suite, I mean, we're, we're in a position where across our suite, we do have one of every, of the, <laughs> of the different categories. Um, so hedge fund is something you will see after some ETFs. If a fund carries the hedge fund tag, it just means that it's a more complex strategy. And it's, I guess it's just a label to show investors that. And it means that it can, you know, by more complex strategy, it just means that it can engage in things like short selling, like our, our bear funds do. Synthetic is a designation that you'll see there um, at the last one. Um, synthetic funds sometimes do cop a bit of a bad rap, but a synthetic um, ETP is simply a fund that uses, it's a fund that uses derivatives to, to replicate its index rather than hold the physical underlying. And what we'll do here, for example, that you know, they're, they're a much rarer kind of uh, ETF and we will use these as the structure generally where it's not feasible to hold the underlying asset. And, and oil is your best example. You can't go out and buy physical barrels of oil and, and store them on a tanker. It's not feasible to do that. Um, and so we have to use a, a synthetic ETF to get exposure to movements in, in um, the oil futures price. Finally, exchange traded managed funds, um, that's there under the, the equity income designation. That basically, it, it covers uh, funds that they're not ETFs, but they're also not complex enough to require you to, to call them um, hedge funds. So they're not passive, but they're not hedge fund. They sit in the middle and they encompass things like our rules-based ETPs, which I'll talk to a little bit. Yeah, sure. and that's that's a really nice segue into the next slide, which talks about the evolution and 20 years ago, and look, ETFs have been around a lot longer in, in the United States. I think they first started in Canada, um, but th there has been an evolution. And look, we talked about um, the, the investment uh, evolution, um, but similarly, ETFs, them ETPs themselves have been through and evolution. So, um, do you want to talk about that? That more passive, and then you know how, where we are sort of today and the different types. Of course, I think this yeah. is one of the best ways that that I know to explain the different kinds of ETFs is sort of talk to where they started, where they are, and all the different kinds that are available to you now. Um, I think you mentioned it before, but remembering that the first ETF was launched in in 1993, so it's now a 30 year old product. And think about what's happened in markets over 30 years. Um, they've seen a lot of different market environments, but also it's natural that over that time frame, that investment managers, you know, like us, like a lot of the pioneers of the US, they said, hey, there's there's demand for an, an ETF over the S&P 500. Well, that means there'll be demand for one over the NASDAQ index, and then you'll have sector indexes and cash and bonds, and now all these other ones like active strategies and funds and funds. So I think, Starting ETF 1.1.0, um, the traditional uh, index fund ETF. So the original ETFs they were designed for ways to really get easier access to the cost-effective index fund that I spoke to earlier. And we generally, you know, you'll hear these described as plain vanilla index tracking funds, and and what that means is they have an underlying index like. Australia 200 index, like the NASDAQ 100 index, which is market capitalization weighted. It's the largest companies to the smallest companies weighted by their market cap. And the fund will replicate that index by holding the underlying stocks in the same proportion as they're held in the index. Um, and also with an ETF, interestingly, they're transparent. So you can see what the fund holds on any given day. So I think you know we've got some some good just a good example here of why someone might just use an, an index ETF over a, just a, 
an, an individual share, for example, I think it's probably worth talking to that um, now. Um, I think we've got a slide here showing our cybersecurity ETF. And so a sector like, you know, cybersecurity, for example, that might be, you can use an index tracking ETF for that. And that might be somewhere where you say, hey, look, I want to get exposure to this sector more broadly, um, but you know, I've got no expertise in picking which particular company in that sector that, that I want to invest in. Um, I don't have any skills in, in fundamental analysis, so I might be better off just buying a basket of, of cybersecurity stocks. And ETFs make that very easy. Um, with something like Hack, you get 35 cybersecurity stocks in a basket. Um, and it's a really, really good way to, I guess, diversify um, the portfolio. Uh, there's a, I think, if we go, if we go to the next slide, um, keep going. If we just jump forward a few slides yep. and just let And the next one, this is the one I was looking for. So, and this shows a really good example of how, an, you know, using an ETF to target a sector rather than a single stock can, can give you a lot of advantages um, as an investor. You can see here, so Mantec was one of the biggest holdings um, in Hack. The individual stock fell 17%. It had a much smaller effect on on hack and on the other side you know you could see that hack continued to then move largely in line with Symantec over time but you didn't have that big fall you didn't carry that single stock risk um, and and what you're looking at is that orange line at the top that that remains relatively steady is that the the hack which is our global cyber security uh, ETF and that that sort of tracks along and, and Symantec is in, in that fund. And you can see that on the on the day um, of a, a big whistleblower or hack was announced, I, th I believe it was, um, that, that stock really, really went down. So if you were holding that individual stock, um, it, it would have been a little bit of a painful day. Um, but again, you can see the, the difference there in, in terms of holding holding an index versus holding that individual and, fund. And that's what we mean by that stock. That's what we mean by diversification. Mm -hmm. That is the biggest benefit of diversification is if you're holding all 35 stocks, you get the benefit when they all, when the sector rises together, but you mitigate a lot of the risks that can happen with holding an individual stock. Mm -hmm. And if we just jump back there to um, just some passive uh, or index fund examples. And Adam really spoke to uh, the fact that it aims to track a benchmark or an index. Um, and we use that A200 uh, there as, a, as an example, which is our Australia 200 ETF. So when you buy a unit in, in, the, um, in our A200 fund, you're essentially buying part of 200 of the top, uh, the top uh, companies listed on the Australian exchange. And, and um, yeah, the, the the chart that you're seeing now is the... It's the Australia 200, A200 fund versus the Australia 200 index. And you can see that they largely track each other um, one and the same. The difference being the effect of, you know, the fees over years, which largely equate to about 0.4%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you'll see it's doing exactly as the index does. So there you go, one of one of the advantages there. So um, that 1.5, and we did talk about um, that example, but 1.5 often referred to as smart. I don't think you use that term, but it does get it does get used a bit. And it it is it just really tracking an index that is not market cap. That's it. So smart beta <laughs> you'll see used as an umbrella yeah. term. Um, it's it's had its genesis long ago and. I guess it sort of stuck. Um, but Smart Beta is, it's simply um, a fund or, or an index that's not market cap weighted. The easiest way, the, the easiest example of this, our S&P 500 equal weight ETF, yep. QUS. Um, with the S&P 500, it's a traditional index, it's market cap weighted, um, largest companies to smallest companies, the thing about market cap and why smart beta can be interesting is something like 
the S&P 500, there's a lot of benefit, long-term benefits from investing in broad passive indexes, we know that, but oftentimes there can be flaws in that index arguably, or there can be things that maybe you don't want in your investment portfolio. A good example at the moment is when we look at the S&P 500, because of the performance of large cap tech in the US you know, over the last 10 years, but particularly in the last three, we've seen that index become very concentrated. And so you've got you know, the, the largest five companies on that index, um, Apple, Amazon, Microsoft, Facebook, Google, they make up anywhere between 20 and, and, and around 23%, but anywhere between 20 and 25% over the past year of the index. And so 25% of your investment returns are now determined by five companies, five companies. which are also very highly correlated. Um, similar in Australia, where the big four banks make up about 30% of our index. And so this is where a smart beta index come in, comes in and where you can look and say, okay, would I get better investment outcomes by investing in all 500 companies equally and perhaps having a more balanced exposure across the sectors, not having as much exposure to, to technology, or can I use a smart beta index alongside an S&P 500 index to balance my portfolio a little bit. And so that's examples of where smart beta works. It can also mean things like targeting um, factors like quality. So some, oftentimes uh, active managers will target a, a particular factor in their process. Um, value managers you might have heard of, growth managers you might have heard of. Well, a smart beta ETF might look to use some of the screening processes and data that they would use, but be, but be able to deliver that at a much lower cost. Mm -hmm. So there's, I guess, two examples of, of how smart beta works. So, And so that um, that's a, a really good explanation. And, and I think QUS equal weighting is, is such a great example of that. So moving on from 1.5 is, is that jump to 2.0. So we're not tracking an index now, we're following some rules. Yes, so <laughs> ETF 2.0 rules-based index, I guess it's a, a broad brush term to, um, to describe the, the, the next phase of ETFs that aren't tracking an index. Perhaps they, have a, they, they might have a more sophisticated investment strategy or they might be a way to, to access um, you know, some institutional level investment strategies that, that weren't previously easily accessible um, to all investors by putting them in the ETF form. Something like our, our bear fund is an example of that. You know, mm -hmm. A lot of institutions would have had access to, well, most institutions have access to the, the underlying instruments that are used in bear. You as an investor with, your, with, with a, an online trading app probably don't. Now you can use bear to, to access that and, and hedge portfolios if, if that's what you would like to do. Um, something like our, our risk managed strategies are, are, would be considered a rules-based ETF. Probably one of the you know, most widely used um, ETFs that uh, would consider a rules-based ETF in terms of growth over the last 12 months to two years is our ethical ETFs. Yeah. Ethical ETFs are a really good example of a rules-based. And we've, we've actually had quite a few questions coming in. Where do Effie and FAIR sit in this? And we, and we haven't used them as examples previously, but it's great that you've used this example because where do Effie and FAIR fit yep. in the ETP family tree? So they're a bit of a mix between smart beta rules based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we talk about um, naming designations, they, they don't have to you know, carry the um, managed fund designation. But Effie and FAIR, good examples, probably I'd, I'd consider them a rules-based ETF. Mm -hmm. And because they have a number of rules around exclusions, so you can see, you know, we exclude uh, fossil fuel uh, producers, uh, alcohol, tobacco, firearms. We then have a next another layer of rules where you have to be 60% more carbon efficient than the average for, for your interest industry. And so that's a good example of, uh, I think, a very good example of a rules-based ETF where we start with the universe of, of 6,000 stocks, we apply our ethical screening rules, and then we end up with the top 200 stocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so just moving on to active ETFs, and you did talk um, 
at the very beginning about managed funds and that active um, active management. Now, sometimes it just makes sense to include, and, and we're not active or passive. Um, there, there are always instances where people would consider either. Um, so, so what's an active ETF? Yeah, an active ETF, um, it's just allowing investors to access the actively managed strategies I was speaking to earlier in the ETF structure traded on the exchange. Uh, we're increasingly seeing globally, you know, the actively managed world is is a lot bigger and, and more diverse, I guess, than the ETF world in terms of number of funds. We're increasingly seeing active managers want to move their strategies into the ETF structure for ease of access to investors. You know, our approach at BetaShares, we do have a number of, of actively managed funds now, and we've really tried to put actively managed funds into the market where we think that an, an active, uh, actively managed strategy can, can add value, maybe where we think that a passive approach, um, where we think they can add value maybe over a passive benchmark, something like hybrids, for example, in Australia. Mm -hmm. um, something like uh, emerging markets is another good example. We have an emerging markets um, active ETF. Emerging markets probably wouldn't surprise anyone that active management has a better record in emerging markets than large cap US equities. Yeah. Um, you know, they're less efficient, a bit more opaque, and you know, oftentimes you might want an active manager when you're dealing with South American equities and, and Asian equities um, to be overlooking the portfolio. And so, um, but you know, potentially Australian investors not too familiar with South American exactly equities. So it's um, often things like that are often where it might be best yeah. to outsource to an active manager. Yeah, and maybe where you might sit there and go, oh, the passive benchmark probably isn't the most efficient way to invest in there. Okay, and uh, just jumping on to that final evolution um, in four point um, and and much more recent evolution, really, um, ETFs of ETFs. Yeah, so this is, I guess, the the final iteration. Um, ETFs investing in themselves. Um, <laughs> so, look, an ETF of ETF with diversified funds, effectively, are a way where we can create an ETF structure to invest in other ETFs to effectively give you a one-stop diversified portfolio, often to your risk profile. So your risk profile, you'd be familiar with high growth, growth and balance. We, one of our more successful diversified ETFs is our all growth ETF, which gives you the ability to, instead of making four trades to build a portfolio, like buying you know, A200, buying an S&P 500 ETF, buying an all-world ETF, buying an emerging markets ETF, or you could just buy DHHF and fund invest in those for you mm -hmm. um, in a weighting that reflects a, a risk profile. Yeah, super exciting. I and we also have, uh, they're listed here, but very, you know, ethical diversified ETFs where maybe instead of buying Ethi, Fair, and our green bonds ETF, um, you can just put them together. Well, you can just buy the diversified ETF and it does that for you. Yep. And I think, I mean, a lot of investors will be familiar through their superannuation, that balanced growth, uh, high growth option. So really this is this is this, a similar concept, but in an exchange traded fund form. Great example. Yep. Um, and also, you know, they rebalance back to those weightings for you. So you're not sitting there all the time going, oh, you know, I want to be, you know, a growth investor or I've gone down the balanced or the opposite where you know I'm a balanced investor and equities have run really hard and now I'm a growth investor, mm -hmm. the fund will keep that balance for you when it rebalances back to its target weights. Love them, love them. Okay, so just moving on, we've, we've sort of talk, we've talked about the naming conventions, we've, we've spoken about what they are and I, I hope this is uh, giving you a, a nice introduction and making, making things clearer. So once you've done your research and you're ready to hit the button, what are some of the things that you need to uh, think about when you're actually buying and selling uh, exchange traded products? Yeah, so um, I guess when, you know, when we talk about buying and selling, how do you, you know, common question, how do I buy ETFs? Um, you know, what are, our, what are our top tips 
for for trading um, for trading ETFs. How do you buy an ETF? It's simply done on the ASX, and so you do it with either your broker or your online trading platform. It's as simple as that. ETFs have a ticket code. You can get that ticket code on our on our website very easily if you don't know it. Um, you put that into your online broking platform and you buy it the same way, same way you would a stock. Um, it, it's actually, and we've seen um, even more questions come through, you know, what do I do if I've got less than 100,000? What, what's the minimum amount do I start with? You know, there's, there's a, lot of, um, a lot of questions people have on that, that barrier to entry, if you like, um, and where they actually start. That's a really good question. Um, there is no minimum for an ETF. In saying that, you do sort of need to be conscious of brokerage costs. So um, fortunately, brokerage is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, which means you know, buying an ETF becomes more, more accessible. You don't want your brokerage to be so high that it's very difficult. So it'll take you a long time to, to generate a positive return. Um, also, that's somewhere where diversified funds that we were talking to before, um, they can help you invest with a smaller amount because it allows you to buy more different kinds of funds in one package. So just things to be aware of there when you're looking at, at minimum investments. In terms of, of ETF trading and best practice, now this is something that, I, you know, a couple of, a few things that I think we really, um, you know, it's great to emphasise with, with new investors. Um, number one here, um, if we can just go to the next slide, I've got some, um, yeah, the next one. Next one, please. Here, um, when we talk about best practice for, for ETF trading, number one is use limit orders. And I, I can't emphasize this enough for, for all kinds of investors now. On your online trading platform, um, you will have an option to set a limit or a price you want to buy at, or it'll, option, it, it'll give you an option for, for um, market order. Always use a limit order and set your price um, to the top of either the bid or the offer that's available. The reason we do that, uh, I love this quote, it's, the, it's a more recent quote, obviously the last couple of years, uh, given the environment, but it's ETF, limit orders are the wash your hands of ETF trading. They're, they're a sanitary measure. And the reason you use a limit order is if, if you put in an order that's too large, um, you can end up paying more if you keep going down and taking out more than what's available at the top of the ask, um, or you can end up getting a price that you don't necessarily want yeah. when, so, when selling an ETF. So you're saying this is the price I'm prepared to pay, and then yeah, and then the market, and then the market, and then the market makers will yeah. will be there and they'll help you yeah, execute. Totally makes sense. But it's something we just can't emphasise highly enough. Avoid trading near the market, open and close. Um, this is actually for for new investors. I think this is more important than use limit orders. Um, you know. Many of you won't have to worry too much about taking out the market makers who are sitting there with millions of dollars on the screen, but avoiding trading near market and open close is perhaps more critical for new investors. And for this, you have to understand how the market works. The market might open at 10 a.m., but the market opens by alphabetical order, which means Westpac opens closer to 10.09 than 10.01. Uh, whereas ANZ is open at 10.01. Now, what that means is if half the market is closed for 10 minutes, market makers who need to see all of the market open at once to know how much the ETF is worth can't really offer you a price that's clear. And so they will often not be there. And so you need to make sure the market maker is in the screen. And so we say avoid what's known as the match or the auction. Don't trade until after 10.10 and get your trade done before 4 p.m. Because effectively the market is blind from 4 to 4.10. Okay. Um, and the market is blind from 10 to 10.10. So if you're trading ETFs, the market is open from 10.10 to 4 p.m., not 10 to 4.10. Well, there you go. Can't emphasize minutes, it. Minutes, I cannot minutes. emphasize that highly enough. <laughs> and the last one is, look, just international ETFs and, and few and, and uh, futures commodities markets, something like QAU, uh, like our gold ETF. Um, in different time zones, the gold market often isn't open until 11 a.m. our time. 
So just be cognizant of when the underlying markets open. That can be a bit challenging for investors sometimes with something like gold trade after 11. Um, and it's also when you're looking at the price you're getting and thinking there's a discrepancy between what the ETF's trading at and you know maybe what you saw on the news, the market moved overnight. Be, be understanding that in the US, they're open when our market's closed and we're pricing different time zones, futures markets, which allow us to price our ETFs. They're open 23 hours a day. And they're about, so the US market's being priced around the clock, even when it's not open. And so what happens is if the US market's closing at five or 6 a.m. in the morning our time, there's a lot of information being disseminated between 6 a.m. between 6 a.m. our time and 10 a.m. our time especially in the US where a lot of results are released after market. So you might see on the news, you know, Wall Street, Dow Jones up, you know, 1%, and then you get to our market and your ETF is down. Well, perhaps Wall Street was up overnight and then maybe Apple reported a poor result and the market opens down by the time it gets to our time. It's mm -hmm. trying to explain that in the simplest way, just understand it can be different to what you read. Yeah, and look, we get we we do get a lot of questions on that, and that's something that I mean we've got we've got FTSE, we've got a European equity funds, so it is something that um, that that we answer questions on. So um, look, if we just jump back um, as a slide, so we spoke about when we when you are ready um, to, to to sort of hit the button and buy and 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 make your investment. So what happens after you invest? Um, how do I know? How do yeah. I know that they're mine or what, what actually happens? Yeah, this is one we get um, we get quite often. Um, it's just, you know, what, what happens after I buy an ETF? Very simple. You'll get a welcome letter or an email from the from the share registry. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll get a lot of electronic communications in ETF. So we obviously encourage you to in, like to submit your email to the registry. You'll also get a chess holding statement um, in the mail, still a hard copy issued by the ASX. Um, that's going to tell you what your closing and opening investment balances yep. are. And so a chess holding statement is sent every time you buy and sell. Yes. So those paper letters come from the ASX, they don't actually come from beta shares. No, they come from the ASX, yep. exactly. Right. So uh, Link Market Services is the um, is our registrar for all of our funds. So you will receive a letter from them. Um, and and a chess holding statement on the activity um, that you that you have done. So two things to, to sort of look out for. Um, a number of our funds uh, participate in electronic communication only. It is really important to um, log on to Link Market Services and enter your email address. Uh, things like tax statements, um, uh, updates uh, are sent by electronic. Uh, email, <laughs> email, um, and and it's just important to to sort of wait to keep in touch. You can also um, uh, elect to participate in a dividend reinvestment plan um, through there as well. So that's an important thing to know. But we will get into that a little bit later. So just jumping forward um, a few slides, getting back to the agenda. So we've talked about all the different funds. We've talked about getting ready to invest. Um, how are the different types of funds used in a portfolio? How can how can people start to think about that? Yeah, um, I mean, again, very common question we get. How do you build a portfolio using ETFs? There are a lot of different strategies um, that you can use to employ. That you can use ETFs to, to deliver investment outcomes. You can use just broad index ETFs and look for a long term strategy. One that um, you will often hear spoken about, which we see used quite a lot in the market, is this idea of a, a core satellite strategy. And the idea behind a core satellite strategy is to use broad index tracking, low cost ETFs as the core of your portfolio, position for the long term, minimising costs, and then using some what we call satellites um, around to, to maybe try and, and generate some, some outperformance. You know, it's where you might use some, some particular, you know, single stocks you like. It's where you might use, you know, some sector or some more interesting ETFs around the core. You might use a, a, core, um, a core portfolio. This is another one. We've mentioned it 
a couple of times in this presentation, but it's where something like you know, one of our diversified um, ETFs might work well as a core. Um, DHHF, for example, might be your core all growth equities portfolio. And then you might use some sector ETFs that you like around that, be that uh, you know, Asian technology, climate change innovation, cyber security. Um, you might use some of the, your favorite single stocks around a core. But for us, you know, it's very important to make sure that portfolios have a, a robust core um, that can help you weather market cycles and ultimately position your investment portfolio for the long term. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the one of the key benefits that people highlight of ETPs is that diversification. Yep. So bringing diversification. So rather than a a core of many different funds, you're basically um, ETFs providing that instant diversification. So, I mean, it does really depend on each investor and their objectives uh, and what they're actually looking to do. And when we went through all the questions as we were building this presentation and where we were sort of trying to decide uh, where we, what we spoke about, we got a lot of questions about what to invest in. Yes, we did. <laughs> and, you know, wh what do I invest from? put my kids in? How do I invest for my grandchildren? Uh, how do I start my portfolio? I've got a thousand dollars. What do I invest in, Adam? So what, what yeah. do I invest in? Yeah, the, li the list of questions here, uh, we sort of got them on uh, on the next slide, but um, you know, there are a lot of things that we, uh, we aren't necessarily allowed to, <laughs> allowed to provide advice on. Um, what you know, we'll generally say, and this is probably the reason why you're even on this um, this webinar in the first place, is do your own do your own research. Um, there's a wealth of information available to you um, to help you, you know, build portfolios and start your investment journey. You know, you all have different circumstances, um, different goals, um, and you know, we obviously encourage people to to seek investment advice. Um, where they're confused, but you know, the, coming to a webinar like this can be the first step. Um, you know, we obviously encourage you to. If there's anything in um, in this webinar that you know piqued your interest or you wanted more information on, you know, there's plenty of information available on our website on the fun page. We post. There's a lot of you know blog and information posts on our on our insights page as well, and in our newsletter that can help you get that information you need to you know, make the investment decisions. Yeah, and, and it's the investment journey, you know, you're really um, building information and building knowledge along the way that is relevant to you. And, and when we do start these presentations with a disclaimer or important information, we really mean it. So, you know, go and seek investment advice if, if, you're, if, you, if you need to, need to um, do that, do your research. Uh, visit, there, there are lots of different websites, Money Smart, a lot of government websites, the ASX. Our own website has a wealth of information and education about our, our own funds, but also about portfolio construction, investment principles, uh, and a lot of other, other things to, to help you build that knowledge, to feel really confident building your um, exchange trade fund portfolio. So if we just, um, jump onto the next slide, which is again, quite quite interesting. <laughs> so some more things to consider. So um, we were talking about the specific funds there. Um, and with any investment, there is always an investment risk. Uh, depending on the type of investment, there will be uh, different types. Um, investment investment uh, complexity, market risk, um, there are no guarantees. Uh, we wish there were, but there never are. Uh, outcomes are uncertain. So um, an investment can go up as well as down. Everything today has been general information only. Again, seek that professional device before investing and do your research. A PDS is a product disclosure statement uh, and a, a, one is issued for every fund. Uh, and these can be downloaded from the resources section of our website. Um, now, at the start of the webinar, you may have seen a holding slide. So it feels like um, 
there has been a great, great deal of interest in this webinar and, and we really do appreciate your time and interest in ETFs and beta shares. And we want to tailor the session or the next session for you. So we might just throw up a quick poll um, and we really will talk about whichever of these topics you want us to. Um, it, we'll run the session next month and we will talk about thematics and mega trend focus. So um, VitaShares proudly has the, the broadest range of thematic uh, ETFs, which we, which we um, are quite excited to talk about. Um, Adam quickly touched on core satellite investing and the basics of uh, portfolio construction. We can definitely deep dive into that if you like. Uh, or uh, a popular topic that we did last year, I believe, um, very popular, was investing for different life stages. So a younger investor, middle age, older investor, what are the things to talk about and uh, to think about, sorry, um, and, and what, what funds may, may be considered for each stage. So whatever you want to talk about, we will, we will get to it. Uh, in terms of questions, I think we might just close off the poll. I don't know, should we show? We'll show you what we're going to talk about. Okay, investing for different life stages it is. Excellent. Okay, it was a bit of a tie with the others. So uh, we've got plenty of things to talk about. So <laughs> we'll get on to it. So uh, some questions now and look, I mean, there's been there's been so many. We will try and get to as many as possible. We're conscious of time and I really don't want to go over. Um, this one I thought is interesting, which, which I actually don't know the answer. Adam, you said the market opens alphabetically. Does it close alphabetically? No, they all okay. close at the same time at 4.10 okay. in what's called the auction. So market goes into auction at 4 o'clock and the prices are set at 4.10 on the close. Okay, excellent. Um, just a, a, a quick one, you, you talked about uh, our bear uh, hedge fund. Yes. Uh, we, we mentioned it um, earlier on. Uh, someone just said, could you please explain an inverse ETF? Yeah, an inverse, an inverse, ETP. ETP, an inverse ETP um, is one that would move up when the underlying asset fell. So yeah, another term for our, our bear suite, bear, BBOS, BBUS could be an, an inverse ETF. Okay, um, on a number of funds, uh, on all of our funds, we have a, a opportunity for a dividend reinvestment plan, DRP. Uh, so how does, how does a DRP work? I know setting it up is done um, through Link Market Services, you can opt in to either a partial or a full DRP. And so uh, it simply means that the dividends get reinvested? Yeah, exactly. So instead of receiving a, a cash distribution, uh, you'll receive your distribution in the form of un new units in the fund. Um, yeah, a lot of people will elect this, for example, if they maybe have a, you know, a longer term in investments, uh, investment strategy and rather than wanting to receive a, a small cash distribution where they would have to then pay brokerage to reinvest in the fund, they would rather just have those distributions over time, continually giving them more units and allowing that investment to grow. That power of compounding. Very much so. Um, what about fees? When do you pay fees on ETFs? Yeah, so you'll see the fee, it will be maybe, you know, 0 0.07 per A200 or, you know, is, you don't pay the fee, for example, at the end of the year, taken out of one lump sum. The fee is taken out in a very small amount each day out of the net asset value of the fund. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of questions here whether uh, ETFs are available on Westpac, if they're available on a um, ANZ trading. So are they available on all online brokers? On any... Yeah. On any brokerage platform where you can buy ASX listed shares, you can buy ASX listed ETFs. 
Uh, and absolutely, we will be sharing the presentation. We'll share the slides. We'll share a recording um, of the session as well, if you want to um, go back and watch it again. Um, there's so many questions. Okay, and um, unfortunately, I think we've run out of time. There is a lot of questions. Hopefully we've answered uh, quite a few during the session. As I said, we'll get a recording and the slides to you. Um, we have a weekly newsletter that I encourage you to sign up to. Um, we also have a course which, which may help, a series of emails that will help you learn the basics of ETFs. So uh, some things to consider, some myths about ETFs, um, how, to, how to invest, uh, and a few other, few other things just to get you on your way. Adam, thank you so much. It's been great to be here. It's been fun. Yeah. It's been good. I hope everyone got, um, got something out of that and there were some takeaways and you feel a little bit more uh, educated around ETFs than an hour ago. Yep, and we will see you for our next session, our ETF 101 on investing for life stages. Thank you very much.